Hey, uh, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is a daily live uh, broadcast that is a Bible study and fellowship. So I uh, hope you will join us uh, not only today, but every day at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, first, I want to uh, just have the, the uh, brothers that are with me right now just introduce themselves, and then we'll, we'll get into the subject matter. But first, uh, Brother Neil, you want to say hi to the, the audience and uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Hello. My name is Neil. I don't have a regular name on here because I like anonymity. But... Uh, other than that, I love Jesus Christ, and I think that's what matters the most. Uh, I enjoy talking to my brothers uh, Luke and Eric here, and a bunch of other people on here that uh, we can uh, relate instead of compare Bible verses. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And uh, I hope everybody, if you're not already subscribed to Brother Neo's channel, uh, then please subscribe to it. And we also have Brother Eric here. Hello. It's me again, Dehalmo. That's D E H A L L M O. Okay, if you're here long enough, you'll find out what that means. And to be honest with you, I know why Neo doesn't. Uh, I've seen Neo in person, and I know why he doesn't want to be seen on camera. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Ha <laughs> Good one. <laughs> All right, well, hi. It's, it is, uh, to me, a wonderful thing that uh, uh, we believers can come together in fellowship and have a, uh, ha enjoy each other's company, have a, uh, have a good time, and even have a sense of humor. Uh, the scriptures, theology is very serious, but um, uh, it, it certainly is uh, proper for us to lighten up sometimes and, and, uh, and have a good laugh. La laughter is good for our soul. And... Really what we want to accomplish every day in these hangar, hangar us more than anything else is, is we want to um, draw people to Jesus. Uh, we want to praise Jesus. We want to glorify him. Uh, Jesus said that uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And he says he that was in reference to his crucifixion, how he would be lifted up on the cross. He said, in that manner, I will draw all men to myself. So our goal here, really, more than anything else, we want to learn about theology, but more than anything else, we want to draw you to Jesus Christ so you can receive the free gift of salvation. That's our primary miss, uh, mission every day. Uh, now, I want to announce a, a little bit of uh, news about uh, these Hangouts, what my plans are. Um, today we're going to be studying the 19th chapter of uh, the book of Proverbs. Now, if you've been following these Hangouts uh, uh, over the last few months, uh, you, you'll know that I've dedicated Wednesdays for studying the Proverbs. I, I coined it um, Wisdom Wednesdays. Uh, but this is this is Monday, and we're going to study Proverbs. Uh, I've designated Sunday as the day to study do the character studies. Uh, we've already studied quite a few characters, including uh, Adam and Eve, uh, uh, Satan, uh, Noah, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and now we've been studying Job for probably several months. We're probably about halfway through the book of Job now, and we've been doing that on Sundays. But what I want to do now is uh, I don't want to be rigid and say a particular day is designated for a certain topic. I, I might surprise you every day by changing it around. So um, I'm, I'm going to continue going through the book of Proverbs, continue going through the book of, of, of uh, Job, but I also have some other... Uh, subject matter and books that I'm very excited about. Uh, we're going to start including in this the study of the book of John. And I, I believe that it's the most important book in the entire Bible. If, if I was told that I had to uh, um, get rid of the entire Bible but I could only save one book, what book would I save? What book would I say is the, the, of utmost importance? Uh, I would say it's the Gospel of John. Uh, that's how valuable, uh, highly I regard that book. Uh, we're going to also continue doing more character studies after Job, 
but uh, I also want to uh, let me see the um, some other projects um, I want to talk about the various heresies that we find we, we see a lot of heresies uh, in the church today uh, I've talked about a lot of these different current heresies uh, over the last seven eight years here on YouTube but all the heresies we see today we really find already even in the first century of the church we find them in the uh, uh, the gospel accounts we we find them in the epistles we find them in the book of Acts none of the things that the errors we see today are new today they've they're ancient uh, and so we're going to we're going to identify the origins uh, the beginnings of these uh, these heresies uh, the other thing I want to do is go into the study of the what they call the church fathers um, uh, you know we have the uh, after Jesus we have the apostles and then at the beginnings of the church uh, from about um, you know 33 AD until uh, let's say the end of the first century but after all the apostles are, were gone you had their um, their followers and some of these people were very very famous and some of them are, are uh, came up with a lot of new theology and some of it just uh, is, is has not been correct so I want to take some time to go into church history look at these uh, uh, early church fathers and see uh, it, it, how they held to the scriptures and how some of them varied away and came up with some uh, uh, new ideas that were, were heretical so th those are my plans, and uh, what day is designated for each one of them? I, I'm not designated a particular day, so each day I may skip around from one topic or uh, theme to it to the next. Um, let me get uh, you give you guys a chance to just make your comments on what I've said so far. Then we'll go into uh, the 19th chapter of uh, Proverbs. Uh, nothing other than. Uh... I'm curious on uh, who exactly can you name at least one of the early church fathers' names uh, for reference for later? Okay, there's 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 so so many. Uh, I mean, of course, um, uh, one of them that is uh, probably the most uh, famous, uh, no notorious. Uh, Doggone it! Uh, now my, my, his name is, uh, he's he's the one that really originated the before Calvin the the, the ideas in Calvinism, and he's also the one that uh, originated eternal torment in hell. I can't. Gosh, you forgive me. I'm from, I've gone a blank. I, I know who you're talking about. I forgot his name too. <laughs> yeah, for some reason. But now that's one one that I wanted to bring to mind, but and I can't recall it. But there are so many. There, there's probably there's probably 50 or 100 of these major uh, characters in history that we'll be discussing. It'll probably take years, years to get through them all. Is it uh, Saint Clemens or Saint Augustine or Saint? Well, yeah, Augustine. Augustine, who was who I was thinking of. But Clement, of course, uh, and many many others we'll be discussing. And I don't I don't I have a, a pretty good um, source of information on all of it. But uh, not only will we be studying it, but I will be learning a lot as I go on it too. I don't claim to be an authority and all that at this point. I'm going to be learning along with uh, everybody else. Right. Okay, um, Brother Eric, anything before we get started into uh, uh, Proverbs? Uh, well, Brother Luke, uh, what came to my mind was uh, spontaneity in the midst of order. Now that's got the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit written all over it. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Thank you. Thank you, Brother. Uh, well, we do ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to guide us in these studies so that we can understand these these uh, theologic t topics and the scriptures. So hopefully that uh, uh, we can get it right. I don't think we're going to always be right as we go through the scriptures. I know I've been wrong in the past. And uh, I expect I'll probably be wrong in the future sometimes. I'm hoping that if I'm wrong, that someone is out there who can correct me because I don't want to remain wrong. I think it would be horrible to be wrong. Brother Lou, I'd like to take this opportunity to correct you once more. <laughs> no, 
Now, when I mentioned spontaneity in the midst of order, I was referring to the methodology that you are employing now with your uh, with these daily broadcasts, which you just recently revealed to us. Okay, back to you. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Let's go into uh, Proverbs now. It's uh, I'm a uh, I'm what uh, Brother Joe Byron coined as a uh, KJV firstist, and that is someone who uh, uh, I will always look at the KJV first, but I'm not against looking at other translations. I'm not against looking at the Greek. I'm not against uh, looking at commentaries. I'm not against going to the brethren and getting their uh, explanations on the scripture. Uh, anything that's going to help me to understand it better, I'm, I'm all for it. But I do believe that I trust the KJV more than any other, so I, I will look at it first. So here's ch chapter 19 in, first in Proverbs, KJV. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. I think that uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified after we, you, you guys talk about it, but what is your first response to that verse? I'll read it one more time. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Well, Brother Luke, I agree with you. Uh, that's pretty straightforward right there. Uh, I would have to meditate it on meditate on it more to get anything else out of it. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Yeah, I gotta check on my son. He he uh, needs a diaper change real quick. But um, I I read that as as almost uh, literally as it says it. Uh, the way it sounds, you know makes sense. I don't think there's any hidden meaning that one can't understand to that verse. It's, it's very straightforward when it talks about uh, perverse. Like, you know, that word right there is a very strong word to use. Strong words in the Bible, if you notice. All right. Um, yeah, it's so many of the verses I find in Proverbs and also in the book of Job um, in the KJV, I, I really find it very important and helpful to look at the Amplified to help me understand it. But, but sometimes we find a verse that is so clear cut that it does it just says what it says, and, it, and anybody should get it. But it says, "Better is the poor." Now, poor is uh, that walks in, in in his integrity. So, in other words, I think that we would all like to have wealth. We'd all like to have prosperity. We'd all like to have a, a abundance and, and not be lacking things. Uh, that's what a poor person is. They're, they're lacking things. But Solomon is telling us here that it, it would be better for you to be lacking and be a poor person uh, and, and, and have your integrity. A poor person, but a, a poor person with integrity is better than a, a person who is perverse in his lips. That means that it's just dishonest and lying and deceitful. That what they're, they're, uh, they're, they don't have integrity, and, is, and they're a fool. So if you had to, your, your life is probably going to be better off in, in every way, even though you don't have material wealth, even though sometimes you're, you're lacking things, maybe even lacking food and shelter sometimes, you're poor, but you have integrity. Uh, that is it is better that is better than you know even having an, uh, not being poor and yet having no integrity and being a fool uh, I'm going to look at it in the amplified and see if it says anything that uh, is of interest here amplified it says uh, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is twisted in his speech and is short-sighted is a short-sighted fool. Um, well, the problem I, I I think that we can expound on that in, in this way that um, the scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil uh, and and greed. 
is is uh, is, is very very common as a, as a condition in, of mankind. We, when we're born, we're all born with a birth defect, and and that is uh, we've inherited a genetic disorder from our ancestors all the way back, back to Adam and Eve. We've all inherited this disorder called a sin nature, the, the nature of fallen man. And, and because of that, virtue does not come so naturally to us as, as uh, avarice, you know, the things that are, that are not virtuous, like greed, like the love of money instead of integrity. So it, it's, it's probably much more common to find the kind of person that is, uh, they're more interested in wealth than they are in integrity rather than this person here that he's talking about. This person is, is not pursuing wealth, or they're, they even have poverty, and yet they don't have poverty of integrity. They are rich in integrity. Uh, so I, whether, whether it's greed and the love of money or any of the other uh, uh, bad qualities, bad, uh, bad character that we see in mankind, uh, uh, it, it does come naturally to us. I mean, I've had people say to me, I remember preaching on the college campus saying that um, a, 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 a woman who was a lesbian said that, why should I, uh, why should I be, um, have to change my, uh, uh, my, the way I am as a lesbian? It's, it's natural for me. And yeah, and I said, well, you don't have to change it to get saved. It's not required that you change your life to get saved. All that's required is that you believe in Jesus Christ and what who he is and what he's done for you and trust him for your salvation. That's all that's really required of you to get saved. But as far as lesbianism and coming naturally to you, yeah, sin comes natural to all of us. And 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 you know the type of sin that you're here, here lesbian and practicing, lesbian and practicing homosexuality, is a sin. It's not the way God intends for you to be, even though it's natural for you. Just like certain sins are comes natural to me. I was a natural born liar. I was a professional liar for 20 years. I, I lied every day for a living. And 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 I could have said, well, it just comes natural to me. I didn't have any guilty conscience over it. Uh, so, uh, but what happens is when we put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into us and starts transforming it and changing our desires. Um, well, I, I might have uh, gone a little bit off topic there, brothers. Anything you want to say about that before I move on to the next verse? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, no, I like to add to that. You know, like you said. Uh, it's not that you have to change anything. There's no works to do. The work has already been done. So to try to change yourself to be saved, it, it, for me, wouldn't work. No matter how much I tried to stop sinning, nothing could, I couldn't be, you know, that, that's not what saved me. I guess finally putting my faith in Jesus Christ that he will change me uh, after, after I had put my faith in him. You know, that, that's, that's the, there's no more working to do. He's working now. He's working for me, even after it's progressive in a way. Uh, even after I was saved, it, everything changed. Yeah, I like the way you phrase that. It's progressive. He's continuing to work. The work that the Holy Spirit is doing is, is transforming us. Now the question becomes, will you listen to the Holy Spirit? Uh, and, and will you let it uh, uh, submit and let the Holy Spirit transform your desires, uh, or are you going to fight it and resist it? And that's that's a struggle that Paul wrote about uh, uh, in, in Romans when he was talking about how he how he said, "I I want to do the right thing, and and yet I do the wrong thing." And he's, "I don't want to do the wrong thing, uh, and yet I do it anyway." And he said, "Oh wretched man that I am." But he said, "It's yet it's not me that's doing it. It's the the of the sin that lives inside me. It's it's the natural man. And, and then we have the born again man, the new person in Christ. And then you have these two people that are struggling. And 
I saw this video years ago about a wolf, a white wolf and a black wolf representing good and evil. And they said, well, whichever one's going to be strong is the one you feed. And which one's going to be victorious? You've got to feed, feed the right one. And if you want, uh, if you really want the Holy Spirit to transform you um, and change your desires, you feed the Spirit through prayer, through Bible study, through fellowship, through some kind of ministry work, uh, and uh, and then you're feeding the, the 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 new man, not the old man. Uh, I'm going to go on, brother. But Eric, anything else to add to that? Well, Brother Luke and uh, Brother Neil, I think uh, what you guys both said about that uh, was really uh, uh, great. You guys uh, pretty much summed it all up. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right. Let me go on to the next verse here. Uh, I'll go back to the KJV and look at verse... 2 chapter 19 verse 2 says also that the soul be without knowledge it is not good and he that hasteneth with his feet sinneth okay uh, all right it didn't take long for me to get stumped here with this uh, old English I'm going to read it again and then I ask uh, one of you brothers to uh, explain this verse to me so he says also, so this is connected apparently to the first. Let me read them both together then since they're connected. It says, better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Also that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. And he that hasteneth with his feet sinneth. All right. This sound a little bit like a foreign language to me, brothers. What does that mean? Uh, like hurries his who and he who hurries his footsteps in different translations also. Um, better to be poor and honest than to be a dishonest and a fool, or some way you know. I like the first one we went over, but yeah, I think uh, hurrying around for no reason. Uh, so some people might say we're just a bunch of ants crawling around on a giant blue ball floating around in the middle of nothing. And we act like there's purpose or some kind of meaning that we need to hurry up and get around this planet for, for uh, basic things like working and you know it's not, it's not really that important. You know what I'm saying? In a way. Yeah, I, I think that what happens, uh, what's happened to you, as a young man, and and what happened to me, it took many more years, but to to understand that, what, what is important. What is valuable? And the things that I thought were important and valuable and interesting to me in my youth, they, they really have no interest uh, for me any longer. The things that are interesting and valuable to me now are, is the way I spend my time. I'm spending my time in fellowship and in the scriptures, and sometimes I get to go golfing. I still enjoy golfing. But much of the things that, I, that held my interest years ago uh, – uh, the scripture says that uh, something, I think it's in Proverbs, it says, uh, trust the Lord with all your heart and, and lean not on, uh, no, and he will change and give you the desires of your heart. Uh, I'm, I think I'm mixing two verses together, but there's a verse that says, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And, and, and But what are the desires of your heart? As the Holy Spirit transforms us, our desires are transformed, and we have new desires. The things that are desirous to me now are a lot different than what I desired in the past. Uh, Brother Eric? Uh, yes, Brother Luke, and uh, that is the fulfillment of the new covenant. It's the new heart of flesh that comes with the new covenant. Because the old man has a heart of stone. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yes, Neil, what were you saying? 
Yeah, I, I was realizing, and I remember reading this uh, Proverbs 19.2 before, and it, it just hit me because I heard, heard a couple of different interpretations about it. Um, I guess the way that they're saying hasten, you know, with, the, with their legs or their feet, that's to, to run quickly towards somewhere means to mean you don't have any direction where you're going. It's actually opposed to deliberation and uh, knowledge because if you're running somewhere, you're not really, you know what I'm saying, you're not, uh, you're not using deliberation and caution. So it's like there, I think there is a uh, there's another uh, interpretation that says the Greeks recognize this that shows the value of deliberation and caution uh, when you sit to where you actually think about what you're doing instead of running because haste is opposed to knowledge. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, well said. Uh, that that goes right along with uh, the Amplified translation here. I'll read that now. It says, uh, also it is not good for a person to be without knowledge. And he who hurries with his feet, acting impulsively and proceeding without caution or analyzing the consequences, sins. He misses the mark. Uh, so that, that agrees with your, your uh, second point there, uh, Neil, that uh, uh, it, we're really being taught here that let's slow down and think before we act. And I would add, not only think, but pray and meditate before we act. Uh, let's not be in such a hurry that uh, that we end up making big blunders. It's like, have you guys ever, if you've ever played chess, you know, chess is made is designed to be played and thoughtfully, and and, and it's a very very strenuous game. It's physically exhausting, uh, only because you're in such thought, such deep concentration, and uh, and and. Uh, sometimes a move may take one minute or five minutes or ten minutes to think and analyze before you make a move. There's another type of chess that's commonly played in a lot of public parks, and it's speed chess. And they, they have like ten seconds or twenty seconds or something to make a move, and they hit a bell or something. I don't, I've never really played that much, but it's very common when you play speed chess to make big mistakes. They, a big mistake in chess is called a blunder. And a big mistake in life, I think, would be called a blunder. So, and that's a perfect way of, of illustrating that when we move quickly without taking enough time to think things through, we're very likely to make more blunders. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Brother Stephen to say hi, introduce himself, and then, then we'll get his thoughts on this. Good evening, Brother Luke. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me in. Um, didn't expect to be here this evening. I'm supposed to be going away, but unfortunately we've uh, had a bit of a tragedy, and I'll talk to you about that off air. But uh, my name is Stephen. I'm from United Kingdom in England. I'm a fellow believer in Christ, um, and I've just joined. I did manage to get some of the earlier broadcast, and uh, I'm happy to be here, and we're all happy to join in when I can. Back to you, Brother Luke. All right. Uh, I'd like uh, uh, Brother Neo to. Uh after he, after you've heard the uh, amplified translation, uh, get your co your uh, comment now. Yeah, uh, I was just going to add to what you're saying. When you're in a hurry, have you ever stubbed your toe and wished that you didn't go in a hurry? You're like, oh man, I could have went slower. I could have I could have thought about where I was looking, but I didn't do that. Yeah. yeah. That that to me, that's a very perfect perfect example of what we're saying here. When you rush. You make a mistake, and by stubbing your toe, you get instant feedback that that was a mistake. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next verse. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to go back to the KJV, and it uh, takes a second for me to scroll back and forth here. Yeah, sometimes I violate the Bible when I stub my toe. You know, some words come out I don't mean to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I uh, I'll tell you what I my uh, uh, manner of speech uh, is is really not profane uh, as a rule. Um, I, even even in my youth, I was not someone who used profanity a lot. Uh, but the times that profanity comes out is a time like that. Sometimes when you stub your toe, and all of a sudden it comes out the the the, the natural man comes out, you know. <laughs> Um, all forgive. right. What was that? I said, God will forgive us, I imagine. Yeah, well, we're already forgiven, so. 
Okay, uh, now verse uh, 3. Uh, the foolishness of man perverted his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. Um, well, one of the things, just I'll just say this again for all those people who have not been following along with Proverbs through the first uh, 18 chapters. Uh, one of the things that we see in Proverbs is that it's really unique uh, in the in the Bible. Um, the rest the rest of the Bible here is really a book of history. It's either a book of history or a, be a book about future history, prophecy. And it's true. It's true historical stories, uh, real accounts. Uh, Adam and Eve is a true account. Uh, Noah and the flood is a, a true historical account. Uh, Jonah and the whale. It's a true historical account. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is a true historical account of real people, real events. But uh, and and each of these books and chapters tell a story, it kind of in a, in a way a story is told. But the Book of Proverbs is is different in that it's not really telling us one story. Uh, sometimes one particular verse stands alone by itself, teaching a proverb, a a lesson, a bit of wisdom, a a, a gem. A, a, a nugget of truth, and, and and sometimes there might be, uh, you know, two or three or four verses that are strung together that to, to make a point. But normally, it's a lot of small lessons, uh, briefly stated, and, and and there's oftentimes a contrast between the 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 wise man and the fool, between uh, the the you know the the lazy man and the diligent man. You know, there's often we see these contrasts, and right here, as as usual, we're we're seeing a contrast in this verse here. The foolishness of man is perverted his way, and, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. So it's talking about the a person who's being foolish. Uh, all right. So let me get your response to that verse, and then we'll I'll look at it in the amplified. Somebody else go first. <laughs> okay, um, let's just have another look at it then. Okay, the foolishness averted his way. I mean, this this uh, talks about I think similar to what you were saying before about rushing and in where sort of angels fear to tread, so to speak, and missing something. It's a foolish thing to do, um, and you know you can lose your way. I've done it before when I've been in a hurry. Uh, rushing around, trying to get everything done, and realizing, well, where am I? Because I've been rushing around, not paying attention to what I've done. I've lost my way. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the second part of this uh, says that, that, you know, that's, you know, against the law because the law wants you to, to reflect and take time on, on these words. That's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the idea of losing your way could be in a broad sense in terms of your direction in life and it could be a very simple thing just like you get in the car and I get in a hurry or something and I'm not paying attention I end up going the wrong direction and making a wrong turn and uh, I miss my turn on the, off the exit on the freeway and I gotta go miles on the way and double back and um, that's, a, that's a simple illustration but it, we could look at it in a broader sense where we're losing our way in life as a, as a whole and, and getting off the, the the, uh, the road of life that we, we want to follow and that we intended to follow. Um, Brother Eric? Uh, Neil, go ahead and respond, and then I will have the last word. Uh, go ahead. The last word with Eric. All right. Uh, yeah, the foolishness of man. You know, I think we sometimes our sin, the sinfulness and of what we do is, is definitely leads us astray in a way um, it's, it's like you can't really it's I guess in a way it's saying don't blame God for your own foolishness if you say it backwards kind of you know say why because it's not going to help anything in the end you can't blame him for what you're doing to yourself if you don't want to believe and you asking for extraordinary things like a Ferrari through prayer of course it, I don't know if that could happen I bet I'd severely doubt it but you know <laughs> that's foolish it's not going to happen. So, I mean, yeah. And then, you know, 
the other verses say that man perverse the perverse man you know they we pervert his ways the ways that the, the same way through prayer like we think we can get a million dollars through prayer or something like that I think that's that's foolishness oh very good Neil uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to greet Stephen and uh, commend him for his faithfulness in the midst of his tragedy. Our prayers are with you. And uh, as far as my commentary on this verse, to me, that's the hallmark of the natural man who works for the man, mammon. And uh, of course he's going to be chasing his tail, worrying about making a buck. And of course he's fitting himself against God okay and all of you uh, great responses back to you brother Luke okay. all right now I know you claimed the last word but uh, you're not going to get it because I'm going to read the whole thing in the Amplify just to see how it phrases it and then we can see if uh, we're on agreement with it verse 3 the foolishness of man undermines his way ruining whatever he undertakes then his heart is resentful and rages against the Lord for being a fool he blames the Lord instead of himself see one of the things we were all focusing on the first half of the verse and we, we wrote I don't think anybody responded to the second half yet but I think that's an important part of this verse is that it's it is very common and this is one of the things in uh, in the book of Job that we've been studying we're seeing is that uh, Job is really is an exceptional person because in, in spite of all the things he's, he's suffered, um, he, he's not angry with God, he's not hating God, he's not rejecting God, he's not cursing God as his wife told him he should do. Um, he still loves God and believes in him and trusts him, uh, even though he doesn't really understand why he's, he's suffering so much. Yeah, but this person, the fool, uh, he... he, he He's rushing around making mistakes and then and uh, is not being successful, and then blaming God for it. Yeah, I think and that's. I'm very, I'm very, sorry, Neo, you go. Go ahead. Oh, I was just well. Two things is uh, what man blames God for his failures. You know the 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 men that don't believe they they're blaming God for his failures basically, in a way. But go ahead, back to you. Yeah, all I was going to say was I used the analogy of us busy in our lives and not focusing on God. I used that as an analogy and how we can lose our way, lose focus on God and Jesus Christ and the things of 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 the of the Word of the Lord. And I think. That illustrates it quite well from that version that Brother Luke read there, and it's um, easy, you know, with everyday life um, to sometimes forget. And I think that's, you know, something we need to try harder to try to remember to do in our lives each day. So I think I was just using that analogy, and I think it's a good analogy, and I also think it also shows that we can. Um, sort of, it is foolishness sometimes to rush around like you said, Brother Neo, and and not think about things and remember who's Lord of our lives. All right, let's go on to the next verse. I think that uh, we've covered that pretty thoroughly. The next verse, verse four, KJV says, "Wealth maketh many friends, but the poor." is separated from his neighbor. By the way, I don't, I'm not going to call on people. Well, usually, uh, I, I, anybody who just feels uh, the, uh, they, they were, they're anxious to speak, just go ahead. And if you don't want to speak, then fine, I'll talk more. But I'm not going to call on you as a, as a method here. Brother Luke, I was happy... I was happy to get the last word in, but at this point, I'd be happy to get a word in edgewise. Okay, back to you. 
All right, Brother Neil, you were about to say something. No, I thought I thought something was going. I didn't I didn't know what the silence was about. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I was just trying to meditate on this word. It's uh, um, I'm reading it from the King James. Perhaps if you could read it from another version, Brother Luke. All right, I'll look at it in the Amplified. Um, I think it's pretty clear cut, but I'm not sure, so sure I'm right. But uh, let's look at it in the Amplified. It says, uh, Wealth makes many friends, but a poor man is separated from his friend. Yeah, I, I think that. Uh, it, but. My question is, are these real friends? Yeah, I, I think I get that, yeah. I think that's what he's is saying, isn't it? Uh, I mean, if you're wealthy, you're an attractive person. It's just that there are certain qualities that attract people. And these are all, as, as Solomon would say, it's all vanity, as he said in Ecclesiastes. But the things that attract man to each other... Um, Good looks, um, fame. If someone's famous. You want to, people want to be their friend. They're good looking. They're a, they're called, even called attractive people because you're attracted to someone who looks good. They they are attractive physically. Uh, money. Um, a lot of times, um, when choosing who you want to, um, a person wants to marry. These all factor in. Uh, a, a woman may be attracted and desire a man is either physically attractive, has a lot of money, has fame, has something to that's a, a better than your average person in their eyes, and these things are attractive to to people. Now, of course, these qualities, once we are the spiritual man, we those things should not be appealing to us. I mean, whether someone is physically attractive is not going to be a factor into my decision to want to have a friendship or a relationship with them. I was attracted to my wife initially. My first glance, I, I was smitten. You know, I was like almost instantly in love when I first laid eyes on her. So there is a, a place for this kind of chemistry and phys physical attraction. But if she was beautiful and yet... Uh, a, a horrible person, then you know it, it wouldn't go very far, or it may it may go far, but then you end up regretting it because you've you put too much value on physical appearance rather than their character. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that wealth is an attractive quality for most people. If someone has money, uh, everybody wants to be their friend, uh, but a poor person. Hard for them to find a friend. They don't. They don't seem to have much to offer in return. Like, like, didn't Jesus say that? Uh, um, yeah, you you give uh, a feast to the to the uh, uh, to the rich people. You invite the rich people to your feast because you know that they're wealthy enough that they're when they, they'll have a feast and they'll in return invite you. But why don't you invite the poor people to your feast? They don't have anything to offer you in return, and they're not going to be able to pay you back by having their own feast. And so I think that all factors in here in terms of the idea that uh, a person who has wealth is going to have many friends. But are they really true friends? Yeah, I would concur with that. It's very well said, I think. Brother Luke, and it's true. I mean, look at the widow's offering. It's mentioned in the Bible. Jesus talks about it in the Bible, the widow's offering. And, you know, and it's, I think it's also about our things that we choose to follow as well. Sort of the, you know, there's a lot of people in this country very big on football, you call it soccer in America, and they, they religiously go around following certain players and certain teams, and they even post in Facebook, this is my friend, and, you know, yeah, probably never really met this person, but it's all they talk about them in such intimate detail as if they they know them really, really well. And these are not real friends. 
Um, and like you say, it's about power, you know, money is another one. You've already mentioned that. Uh, and I think, you know, that what you said is spot on, brother. All right, I'm going to go to the next verse in the KJV. Uh, it says, um, verse 5, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Uh, Also, a false witness, of course, is a liar. And it says a liar will, 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 will be punished. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. So it's really just repeating the same idea. Uh, if you lie, you're going, to, you're going to suffer the consequences. Now, is a person always punished for their lies by God? Um, I mean, a lot of people like to cite the verse that uh, all, all liars, you know, all adulterers, all fornicators, all liars will go into the lake of fire. And that's true, except the fact that once we get saved, we're saved from that. Uh, so not everybody's going to be suffer the, these consequences because of their, their lies and their sins, uh, because... Jesus paid for our sins, but it doesn't mean that we don't. People do not suffer consequences and have some kind of penalty and, and uh, uh, loss for for lying and cheating and stealing and envy and and all these these things that uh, God doesn't want us to do. When we do them, we have the law of reaping and sowing that comes into play, and and then we also have the uh, the the law for the the. Uh, the born again child of God is going to be um, chastised because if a father loves his child, he will chastise, he will discipline them. So if we get out of line in some ways like that, God, God may correct us. And if, even if God doesn't correct us, if if you lie and cheat and steal and do bad things like that, you're gonna, you may find out that uh, the person you lied to may may take revenge on you. Or you steal from someone, maybe the court system will prosecute uh, prosecute you, and you end up going to jail. So I think that's that would be the application here. I wouldn't say that the uh, the idea that um, um, a false witness shall not be unpunished. That uh, I don't think that applies to uh, you know. Of course, it doesn't apply to salvation. You guys have any comments on that? Sorry, got a phone Brother call. You got... Go. What did he say? He had a phone call. What? Yeah, I said I got a phone call. Go ahead, Eric. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I guess Neo left. Uh, what does BBL stand for? Uh, I think be back it's later. Be back later, maybe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. He might be back later, but we might not be here later. I'm, I'm trying to keep these to an hour now. But, um, uh, Brother Eric, uh, what? How would? How do you see that verse? Oh well, Brother Luke, to me that's really, really, really good news. That's the best news I've heard all day. Oh, I just love this verse. I'm gonna make it my war cry. Okay, now. What verse were we on? <laughs> uh, okay, I got it. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and read it again. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. We can claim that promise and apply it to those false gospel preachers. Okay, we can use that as a weapon against them. And we can be confident that God is going to shut them down. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good. I'm glad you connected that. Uh, because t 
to me, you, you could lie or be a false witness about a lot of things, and and uh, it's to me, I would call them a kind of minor infractions. Uh, even though sometimes if a person lies, it could cause serious harm to someone else. So to the person that's uh, been harmed, they might not consider it minor. But I, I, to me, I'm talking about comparing it to a false witness about the gospel. Someone who is preaching a false gospel, uh, false witness in that respect, Brother Eric, you, you are right. that um, then we have a real, real serious problem, and as Jesus said, they're not only going to hell, but they're dragging many people uh, into the ditch with them. Okay, I'm going to read the next verse. Uh, let me change this back to the KJV. And we'll go to verse 6. Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. It looks to me like that's the same point. The, you know, a, a person who is able to give gifts is a rich person, a wealthy person. The prince obviously is a rich and powerful person. And it's the same idea that uh, when people have a lot of power and wealth, and then... then uh, uh, you know, obviously they're going to be popular. I mean, everybody's everybody's going to want to be their friend. Everybody's going to be want want to be on the good side of them. But the poor poor person, uh, that person doesn't seem to have many friends because they don't have anything to give. But Jesus told us that's the person we need to befriend. That's the reason person we need to invite to our feast. Brothers. Yeah, I think you nailed that one, Luke. It looks very similar to a previous verse. I don't really think I've got any more to add. You mute it, Brother Luke. Yeah. Okay, I'll look at the next verse here. Uh, still on the KJV, verse um, 7. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursueth them with words, yet they are wanting to him. Well, I think I know the general idea, even though I don't understand necessarily, yet they are wanting to him. Uh, Brother Eric, what's your response to that? Uh, well, Brother Luke, uh, we're continuing on in the rich-poor uh, type uh, situation. Uh, the second half of that verse, though, he pursueth them with words, yet they are wanting to him. It sounds to me like he's saying the poor... He's trying to uh, gain their their favor, but he's unable to. Is that what's what what it's saying? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, the, the amplified I think makes it clear here. It says, uh, uh, "All the brothers of a poor man hate him. Uh, how much more do his friends abandon him? He pursues them with words, but they are gone." <laughs> Oh man, this uh, the poor, poor person. It's just. I mean, I, I think the first thing that we all should do, and again, I don't know the whole story of your lives, but I think I know you well enough to say I don't think any of us were born into extreme poverty, into a horrible place in the world. I was born here in Las Vegas, Nevada, in the USA. And it's a country that has a, a lot of wealth and abundance. And, and uh, even the poor people in our country have, uh, you know, color TVs and cell phones and computers and cars. And, and But the poor people in other places around the world, and they're really poor. I mean, some of these people are still pushing over a tree stump to try to find some termites in there to eat. Uh, so uh, we, are, we should just thank, thank the Lord every day. 
for just the, the blessings of our birth, uh, that we are, we are born uh, into families, into communities, into a place where we didn't have to suffer such extreme poverty and, diff and hardship. Uh, and if you're watching this and you, you have gone through that, then, then you, you, have, you have my, my great sympathy and, and because life has been harder for you than it was for me. But um, that's what this is really all about, telling us that we, we should have sympathy for the poor. And then we take our sympathy a step further into action uh, to help them when we can. And that's why when I talked about all these words, I did a four-part series on words and terminology this last week. And uh, uh, one of the words I talked about was sin. And, and sin, a lot of people think of sin as a, as, a, as a very technical thing, like you violated, you broke the law. Uh, and the scripture says if you break the law, that's sin. But sin is broader than that. Sin, sin is not, not only when you do a bad act, like you lie or you steal, uh, but, but sin is also even you think about doing it, you sinful thought. But what many people neglect to understand is the concept of the sin of omission, where you omitted to do something good. And when we see a poor person and we were able to help them in some way and we neglect to do it, that's a sin. That's a sin of omission. So I think what we're really learning here in these verses is let's have a, let's have a heart for the poor people and, and uh, let's, let's do what we can to help them and be their friend. Um, I think that's the last verse we'll do today, but let me get your thoughts on that. Uh, and then we'll make our closing remarks here. Just a quick comical side note. When I first read that thought, that verse, I thought it was talking about a politician. <laughs> yeah, um, just a little side bit of humour there. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I'm not so sure. I mean, it's a... Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is connected to the verses that we read before. Um, and, you know, and uh, I think it is, you know about having a heart for the poor, uh, but you've got to have the right reasons uh, for wanting to help the poor, not just a simple act, donating, say, to charity, just, you know, because you know you feel guilty for them, uh, you've got to do it out of, out of God's guidance, and out of God's love, you've got to be guided by God. There are lots of people in the world give to charities, and they don't really understand what God says about the poor and the needy of this world. So I think I think there's a warning there as well that it's got to, there's got to be this correct if I can put it like just be a little bit controversial here <laughs> there's this correct sort of attitude of your mind that this you know you're giving to the poor because God has put that on your heart and that's what you need to do and, and not just to simply do it for show if you understand what I'm trying to say back to you yeah I think that's a, that's a good point and Jesus certainly went out of his way to make that point. Uh, saying that uh, they were doing things for show. The Pharisees, the religious uh, hypocrites, he called them, they, that they, they say these long pr public prayers just to get attention. He says, but no, you should go play, pray privately in your closet. Uh, they give, they, they fast, and they make themselves look really bad instead of refreshing up their face. They, and they want everybody to know that they've been fasting and suffering. He so says it's, it's all for their own attention. And... Uh, and so the motive behind what we do is also important. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason, and I don't think you're going to get any gold or silver or precious gems at the judgment seat of Christ for that. Uh, uh, Brother Eric? Brother Luke, that reminds me of the words of Jesus. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them. What a precious gift we have to offer. In most cases, they receive it gladly. That, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to scriptures. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God and the salvation. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, well, we... We want to learn wisdom as we study this book of Proverbs. That's really why Solomon wrote the book. 
He says he's writing it to teach his son wisdom, and because he wrote it down, it's preserved, and we can learn wisdom from Solomon also. And yet there's so much of it. It seems like everything in the Bible, every theological subject and topic, as you go along, all of a sudden it ends up making a U-turn and getting right back to Jesus. Everything really comes down to Jesus. And and that's that's uh, what this ministry here is on YouTube. is It's, it's all really about Jesus and, and this free gift of salvation that he's offering everyone. So we want to make sure that we cover that. It doesn't take long because salvation is simple and easy. So I'm going to ask you two brothers here just a series of questions, and I want you to answer these questions in like one sentence as briefly as you can here. Okay, so uh, first question is, uh, who is this Jesus that we're referring to? Brother Luke, this Jesus that we are referring to is God's right hand of salvation. According to scriptures, God's only begotten son. God gave him up for us. Filthy sinners. Okay, God loves us very much. So much so that he sacrificed his own son for us. It's that Jesus who died and was buried and rose again. That Jesus that we believe on, who freely gives us life. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right, thank you. So this Jesus that we're saying is so essential that this entire Bible really revolves around him. Even the Old Testament, uh, it, before his name is even mentioned, really the Old Testament is all pointing to him. And, and, and the New Testament is all pointing back to him and saying, this is the one that was promised in the Old Testament, and it, it's Jesus. That's what Peter, Peter said in his first speech, is that the, the, one that you've, uh, the one that you've killed is the one that was promised to us, the Messiah, the Savior. Uh, so, yes, he is God. He is eternal. He was not created, does not have a beginning. He's eternal God, almighty but he became a man known as the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And, and, and he's also this person who died on a cross to pay for our sins. And he also is the one that was raised from the dead to show us that this is promised to you, a resurrection to eternal life if you put your faith in me. So this is the Jesus we're asking uh, you to put your faith in. And my next question is, why is it necessary for someone to believe in Jesus? Is it really necessary, and why? I believe it is necessary to have a relationship with, with Jesus Christ uh, so that we can have a better understanding of the person that actually created us because he is God incarnate. He was God incarnate in human form. He came down from heaven as a man, as you rightly said. And he created us, and he wants his creation to understand him, so it's important for us to have a relationship with him. Um, and that was the whole reason for him to be here, so that he could have this relationship with us, and we could have knowledge of the loving creator God that he is. And he gave us this gift of the Holy Spirit to help and guide us along the way. So I think it is important for us to have that, so then he gives us this free gift of salvation that's been mentioned, promised us his eternal life simply by believing in him, not necessarily knowing anything else, just having this faith in believing in Jesus Christ, who died for us and three days later rose from the grave. Back to you, brother. All right, then. Uh, I think that the people know what they need to know now. They know Jesus is God Almighty. He became a man. He died for our sins. He, he's raised from the dead to, sh to prove he is God and he has power over life and death. And the last thing we want you to know is that this life everlasting is offered to all of us as a free gift from Jesus. You don't have to join a religion to get it. You don't have to become a religious person. You don't have to follow a set of religious rules. But there is one thing you have to do. You have to put your faith completely on Jesus. 
Don't think you can get to heaven without him. Don't think you can do it on your own. Don't think you can do it through religious practices. Instead, you must put your faith on Jesus and depend on him. Depend entirely on Jesus to get you to heaven, and he is faithful. He will do it. All right, brothers, I'm going to close the live broadcast, and we can talk alone privately here uh, for, for a little bit. Uh, so everybody who's watching, thank you for watching and join us daily, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.